Hi, welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast brief is I'm Mark Owen, and each week I invite a panel of business and civic leaders to review the morning papers, find out what's happening in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. First, I'd like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hazelwood's Business Accountants and Advisors, who are absolutely brilliant. They just don't make coffee, they do lots of other things as well. Right, let's introduce the panel. If you like the show, please like, share and subscribe. So this week, we've got Andy Cullop. He is the CEO and Vice Chancellor of Hartbury University and College. Andy is responsible for around 800 staff, 4,600 students split over the main campus with a turnover of 50 million. We've got Laurie Bell, she's the CEO of a Chilton Trust that looks after the Wilson's Museum, the pump rooms, the town hall, the leisure, lots and lots of stuff around Cheltenham. They have around 120 staff, full-time staff, and a turnover of 8 million. And last but never, never least, we've got Dorian Rag. He's the partner of Brute and Knowles Chart Surveyors, who have 160 staff and turn around 14 million. And he is a property guru. That's how I like to big him up anyway. OK, let's have a look at what's making the papers. I'll share my screen, courtesy of the BBC. Here we go. The Daily Mirror. Migration chaos. No control, no compassion, says the Mirror. The I. UK population set to overtake France for the first time on record. Who would have thought? The Daily Express, Rishi, I get it. You want migration down. The Metro, uni's told, get out of migration business. The Guardian, the Guardian, what do we have here? Braverman plan to deport 3,000 asylum seekers each month. And the other story caught catching my eye was the anger at delay of 40 new hospitals. The Daily Telegraph, Mortgage rates shoot up amid the bond chaos. The Financial Times, ministers look at reshaping pensions, lifeboat fund to give boost to business. The Times, bonus for GPs if patients take part in clinical trials. The Daily Mail, will anyone stop these eco clowns? And the Daily Star, we love the Daily Star, invasion of the monster jellyfish. That's what's making all the headlines today. And I'm going to start with you, actually, Andy, because the story that caught my eye was the one in the in the Metro. Uni's told to get out the migration business. I thought yeah. you might be interested. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Mark. And uh, very pleased to be to be with you. Um, it, it's a really interesting area. And I think actually there's there's quite a strong case to be made for international students studying in the UK. And, and that case it's partly financial, they contribute significantly to the UK economy, but it's partly cultural as well, and it's partly their contribution to, to campuses and to university life. So just a, a few figures. So in the latest migration figures, um, there are 361,000 non-EU students, and there's been some really good work done that's recently been published by the London um, Economics Report, looking at the benefit of, uh, uh, of international students to, to the UK. Um, and they've done lots of clever sums. They've looked at the net benefits. So they've looked at how much international students spend in the UK. And they've looked at how, if they bring dependents with them, how much those dependents uh, spend and what resources those dependents take up. So they've looked at the net benefit of international students. And they've come up with a figure of about £37 billion net contribution to the UK economy. That was for the first year cohort of students that started in 2021, but it would be similar for, for different years. So there's a really strong financial contribution from international students and, and, and they've broken that down and looked by region, which is quite interesting. So um, Hartbury, um, College Hartbury University is just on the edge of the Forest of Dean and the contribution of international students to the Forest of Dean is just over 27 million, so 27.4 million, which I think works out to be about 315 pounds per resident. Um, obviously, Gloucestershire contains many, many different regions. Just to give you another example, if you look at the city of Gloucester, the contribution from international students is uh, almost 44 million, again, at around about £330 um, per resident. So, so I think there's a strong financial argument for international students studying in, in the UK. But it's more than that, because having international students on, on UK campuses diversifies those campuses. Uh, and it really does um, enrich the learning experience. I, I guess the other thing to say, and this is um, probably slightly contentious, um, international student fees uh, are higher than home student fees. 
home student fees have been capped uh, since basically since 2012. Um, in 2012, the, the home student fee went up to, to £9,000. Um, it went, then went up to 9250 but it's been capped ever since. Um, if inflation had been added to those fees, they would be probably worth about £13,500 now. So, so many institutions are effectively teaching, into, teaching home students um, at a loss. So international student income provides a mechanism to cross-subsidise home student income because the fee level for home students hasn't been raised. Now, that's obviously a political issue and a government issue, but there has to come a point where the, the government releases the brakes on, uh, on home student fees. International students also contribute to the talent pipeline. You know, the vast majority of international students would go back to their home country after they study, but some would stay in, in, in the UK. They would uh, contribute to uh, the economy of the UK. They, they would be well-trained uh, individuals that would work in, uh, in different sectors of our, of our, um, uh, of our economy. So, so I do think there is um, a, a, quite a strong case for international students. And I feel that international students are a, a bit of a pawn in the immigration immigration debate. U universities, particularly for a long time, have argued that international students shouldn't be part of the immigration cap because they're temporary and, and they have particular um, circumstances. And, and I guess I just worry, it, you know, as as a as a country, uh, we have a gold standard education system. Our education system is is is, is the envy of many countries around the world, which is why international students want to study here. And I just worry that. Some of the messages that come out of government um, are not very encouraging um, and there is plenty of competition. So in terms of English speaking countries, uh, there's places like America, places like Australia, places like Canada that international students could go to. So, so I just worry that this whole messaging that's going out is, is, is effectively discouraging international students from, from studying in the UK, which I think is a real shame because, as I say, you know, I think they contribute significantly. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think they're, they're generally a good thing. Wow, I, I, could, I couldn't agree more, to be honest with you. And we need them. We need them. And Laurie would probably say that we need immigration. You know, every single company I go to, every single business sector says they haven't got enough people. It's as simple as that, really. Thanks ever so much for that, Andy. Uh, we're going to go over to you, Laurie. What have you picked out from the papers or the, or the main media today, please? Oh, I, I think... Um... Couple of things. The first thing I would say, following on from Andy, is that you know, in our industry, both hospitality and leisure, we rely on them um, international, not just students that stay in the country, but also students that are currently training at the moment or or in education to come and join us. And, you know, we've got a massive, massive, and it's national situation shortage of lifeguards. So I wasn't going to talk about that, but it is a really, really big issue because it means then. You know, it's really difficult to teach children to swim. It's really difficult to do um, the educational curriculum on, on swimming and to then take it into adult swimming as well. So we're just desperately, we're, we're even now, so I'm, I might take this offline with Andy, but we're looking at setting up an academy mm. to, to try and get students to take on these extra skills mm. that probably they wouldn't even dawn on them to do, but actually they're life skills that would help them in so many ways. And that wasn't what I was going to talk about this morning, but you just stimulated me to think you know yesterday at work we were talking through how do we build academies for these life skills that are, are, are just beneficial to everybody in the community and we cannot we are hundreds of hours short on lifeguarding at the moment but and it's not on, uh, putting the money up putting market supplements it's not about that it's just they're they're just it's it's capturing the right audience to come and do it but also you've got That's, this what well, you've got yeah. a fantastic stream of young people there athletic fit exactly sport i mean i you know that's what a great connection yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, exactly exactly so we we're looking at all sorts of schemes to, to, to you know literally to get them qualified for free you know on the basis that they give us back their student years and their part-time hours to help us do the lifeguarding so i'll talk to you offline about that because i think that could be quite good um, no, what I was going to talk about was inflation, really, because I think yesterday it hit the news. And, and again, it's been covered a bit today about the drop in inflation for the first time now in eight months, which has got to be good news. However, 
what they're saying is whilst retail is beginning to pick up, and I think um, you, you um, actually uh, covered this week, Mark, that M&S profits are up by 4% for the first time in years. And also, you know, LK Bennett that's just come back onto the high street in Cheltenham on the promenade, they're also in profit. So retail spending is going up. Definitely, we're seeing a trend in hospitality spending going up. However, what we're what we're not benefiting from at the moment is food inflation. And each and every one of us that goes shopping every week, we just know. I mean, I can't believe some of the prices now of some of the products that you buy. And for us in hospitality, particularly running the cafes and some of the great big banqueting events that we do, that the cost of supplies is just astronomical. So as, as much as income's going up, unfortunately, expenditure in many ways is overtaking that. And there's only so much you can keep passing on to the customer. So I think I think I don't know when things are going to even out here or when things are going to start to get better. But I think the other bit of good news that's just been announced is that energy bills now they think are going to drop as well because they're renegotiating on some of the deals there, which certainly for many, many households, you know, that are currently in absolute extreme poverty and struggling to, to choose between food and bills. I mean, hopefully with the sun shining now, that will ease some of the pressure. But as we move back into autumn and winter, something I think has got to happen to reduce this these astronomical bills that we're all facing, whether it's, you know, energy or whether it's it's literally food and supplies. Well, I'd love to know what the energy costs are for university and college, but we'll come back to that. Um, yeah, but, well, I can tell you for leisure, they're pretty high as well. Running well, a leisure well, centre, particularly with four pools, um, it is absolutely crazy. We'll come back to that in a second, if that's OK. Let's go over to Dorian. Dorian, great to have you on the show. Um, what have you picked out from us, please? Morning. I've got three quite interesting stories, hopefully. First one is uh, mortgage rates in the Telegraph. Um, interestingly, um, inflation seems to be going up still. It was up 8.7 last month, 8.7%. And that's caused the banks, obviously, to um, reconsider what they're prepared to lend money at. Um, we uh, Nationwide have put their interest rates up now by uh, four, uh, 45 base points. Um, so the cost of borrowing is going to go up. That will probably go through the sector. And they're now expecting interest rates to hit 5.5 percent is currently 4.5 percent so there is this knee jerk and, and um as laurie quite rightly said it's energy costs they're remaining stubbornly high um costs in the wholesale market are 70 percent of where they were a year ago and yet that's still not filtering through because of how energy companies are buying long term instead of spot so there's problems there and food costs but it's not filtering through so we've always got these, these different stories coming through on the one hand we've been told inflation's coming down and yet um, inflation seems to be going up, I, I, you know, and you look at it, how do you make head or tail of what's going on? It's very, very difficult at the moment. So but anyway, the cost of borrowing is going up. Um, that will impact the housing market and it will impact the, the commercial property market without doubt, because there is just a degree of nervousness already in the sector. Oh. The other um, story, a bit um, closer to home in the Gloucestershire Echo, is the fact that they, the Lib Dems have called in to review the um, Tewkesbury Garden Town plans, um, which, as you know, is, is planning to deliver about 10,000 houses, which are much in need around Tewkesbury. Um, concerns about, and I, and I think they're looking at it uh, from an infrastructure perspective, because the impact already on the A46 has been quite dramatic. Uh, it's always been a busy road, but now, I, I live in the area. We've got traffic jams seven days a week. Um, and so there is this concern that um, pausing this, if they don't go forward with it, will cause a hole in the, the five-year housing plans. But, but to my mind, it, there's this whole question about infrastructure. And a few years ago, we started this debate about the A46 extension because the A46 is a main relief road from the M5, uh, linking right up to Leicestershire with some key hubs. And you can drive all the way down from Leicester down to um, towards the M M5, uh, and the only place you hit traffic lights is in Ashchurch. And suddenly we've thrown in three extra sets. So um, you know it's self-defeating. Someone really needs to get control of this and start looking at where we're going to put this the relief road. For my money, it should go to Tennington Hands, out around the back of Pannington, then link up with a probably dropped Junction Nine. Um, but there's no there's no uh, debate about it. I'm not seeing any correspondence about it or any engagement. And I think that's a key, one of the key issues with the garden town that needs to be reviewed. Well, for my no, money. 
I, thanks ever so much for bringing that one. We actually ran that story uh, a couple of days ago as well. Um, and it's a worry. It's a worry. A new political party can come in and new leadership and just put everything on hold that's been five or six years work is just now going to stand still until they kind of have a look at it but anyway let's let's we'll we'll park that one for now but thanks ever so much for those stories Dorian. i'm going to go back over to you andy mm. hey you've got a big summer of events coming up haven't you at top mm. lots and lots of stuff going on can you quickly explain and what it what it means to the college and uni please andy Yes, certainly. So, so at Harbury, we we run a number um, of, of big, large-scale events uh, actually th throughout the year. Um, so, for example, we have our equine events coming up. So, um, we're, we're well known in the equine area. We've got some fantastic facilities, um, and we host um, every year a three-day uh, event for uh, British eventing. Uh, we also host the Festival of Dressage uh, for dressage riders, and we also host the Festival of, of Show Jumping for um, show jumping riders. So, so they're quite large scale events that, that happen every year. We have smaller events pretty much every weekend happening um, in, in equine. Uh, we also have uh, a, a championship men's rugby team and a premiership women's rugby team. Um, and they will play home games uh, with us and obviously play, play away games. So we have uh, have those events. The, the, women's, the women's Premier 15s uh, team we share with Gloucester Rugby. So uh, fantastically, they play, play some of their home games uh, at Kings Home, which is which is just wonderful. And they're, they're absolutely flying at the moment. They're, they're top of the Premiership, which is which is just wonderful. So, so we have a, a range of events. We've got also got sort of Open Farm Sunday coming up. I think that's coming up um, sometime um, in June. So, so there's all sorts of things um, going on, on 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 campus throughout the year, which which is really great. It gives campus a, a really fantastic buzz. And the other thing is, you've been in position a year now. That was a pretty quick year, wasn't it? <laughs> what would you say? Not, not quite a year yet, but almost. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Um, uh, and I've done a big interview with Andy, by the way, which we come and we'll be uh, releasing very shortly. Um, fascinating, actually, background, and and really great to talk to you. Um, what would you say has been the biggest biggest thing that you've learned about Gloucestershire or, or the uni in that in that short year? Yeah so, so um, first thing to say is that I'm really enjoying being in the region so I'm not from this region um, I've spent the last probably 25 years or so um, in the East Midlands so not from Gl the Gloucestershire region, region really enjoy moving here I really enjoy campus we have an absolutely beautiful campus so um, I'm, I'm, I'm really really enjoyed um, our campus and I've really enjoyed just exploring some of the area around campus, some of the area um, in Gloucestershire. Um, I cycle a bit, uh, not very fast these days, and, and I ride horses a bit as well, not very well. Um, but it's great to get out uh, either on the bike or on the horse and, and, and experience the fantastic countryside that uh, that, that we've got uh, in Gloucestershire. Uh, there's much, much more for me, me to see. And now that the uh, good weather's here and it's finally stopped raining, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting out, getting out further afield uh, with the family and the dogs and, um, and and seeing more of what Gloucestershire has to offer, which, which so far has been fantastic. Well, it is an absolutely fantastic uh, county, as, as we all know. So many different elements. Thanks ever so much for that, Andy. And I have heard through the grapevine that actually you're a pretty good horseman as well, by the way. So uh, I don't know who told you that. <laughs> uh, I don't want to big you too much. Uh, but anyway, uh, Laurie, let's go back over to you, please. Uh, now, you know, it's it's been well documented that there have been problems with the planning uh, situation with the uh, uh, with the cafes that you've got there, the pump rooms. Can you just explain where we are at the moment? Yeah, so, so Mark, I'm sure you're you're aware that the cafe kind of organically grew out of COVID. So um, the, the pump rooms has never had a, co a cafe since 1930. So uh, during COVID, when uh, the government gave permission that you could use outdoor space, but nothing indoor, we decided to just test something and open a cafe there uh, with two trestle tables, a barista machine and a couple of cakes. And um, it organically grew literally within days, weeks, months. And now it's as, as if any of you've been there and you've seen it, it's, a, it's quite a large orangery, uh, temporary orangery um, at the side of the uh, pump room. So we've had quite a bit of controversy in that, you know, it's it is um, a grade one listed building. It's in the top six percent of the most protected buildings in the country because it was the original spa water and therefore um, 
is, is basically iconic in its own right. So anything you do now to that building is always going to create a lot of opinions and a lot of concern and particularly, um, uh, you know, at, at historic England level where they are literally trying to protect these buildings. However, the other side of the coin is that we've also got to make this historic building that costs an absolute fortune to run and to maintain as sustainable as possible. And this is where the dilemma comes in, that if you look at somebody like the National Trust across the whole country, if you go to any of their properties, there is inevitably a cafe. Most of those cafes are conservatories or orangeries or pop ups or whatever, but they all have a cafe because it's not just about the, the, the additional secondary spend income and the sustainability then of being able to invest that income back. It's also about that whole visitor experience. And what we've discovered is that the pump room is in the most beautiful location. You will know it's right, right at the top of Pitville Park. It is an incredible setting and it's a de destination in its own right. However, previously when I joined the trust literally four years ago, um, the, the pump room was almost derelict. It had nothing going on in there. It was closed more than it was ever open. There was certainly no big park events. There was nothing happening there. And what, what we started to do in COVID was when we opened the cafe, and then we brought some music into the park to make life just a little bit better for everybody during those awful COVID uh, months and, and years, basically. We brought music into the park, very simple, and we started to create almost this um, brand new offer that people didn't want to see it go. So the, the orangery is temporary. Um, we, we, we keep modifying it and trying to make it work. We want to look at a sustainable and suitable long-term permanent solution. But to do that, it's going to take a lot of time. And we were able to get the planning permission for the current orangery um, be because there were no permissions during COVID, which I'm sure you're all aware of, which is a similar situation, as you mentioned, Mark, with 131, in that they relaxed all of those to allow people to be outside and to do things a bit differently. However, that all stopped last September. So the, 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 the borough council, who were well ahead on the game on this in terms of extending those permissions and, and trying to help local businesses, then said, right, now you've got to apply for proper permission. So when we did that, the, 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 the civic society, local civic society, quite rightly raised a number of issues about the building, as did Historic England, as did the conservation officers, and the list goes on and on. However, what we're saying is now, you know, we 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 that that cafe is worth. I mean, you know, I'm not going to go into too many figures, but it's it's worth not far off of a million a year now, and that the, the footfall there is absolutely an enormous. I mean, you know, we we've had about 1.5 million visitors, and if you look at the the cafe as an anchor for things like we did um, last year's jubilee event, this year we were the only place that did the coronation on large scale. You know, we brought in a huge screen. The police estimated they were with us all day. They estimated at peak time just before the concert went live because we broadcast the concert on Sunday night. There was twelve and a half thousand people in the park. You couldn't see the grass for people. And, you know, the, the, the cafe anchors that for us because the only way we can do these events for free is with secondary spend and donations. So the more people that buy, the more we can reinvest, the more we can give back to the community and more we can keep the heritage building going. So it's it's this cyclical you know it, it all makes sense but because it's grade one listed we're, we're up against it so the long and short of it is the planning permission we are just waiting to hear but we think it's going to be um at the committee this in in june um i think it's about the 15th of june and we're just fingers crossed because if they say and this is the second time we've applied because last time we applied and they said no we needed to do a bit of modification we need to go back to the drawing board we've done that and we've said look just give us the temporary we'll change the color of the roof if that's offensive it's white we'll make it clear you know it is see-through you can still see the building it's not that we block the building and from the part looking up any of you that have been there you cannot even see the cafe so you know it's 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 one of those things that you know, I could talk about it all day, as you've got. I know you could. <laughs> <laughs> I know you could. But Sorry. Put, Dorian, put Dorian's chaplain at the bed. He just used up his slot. <laughs> Sorry. Dorian, 
Dorian, don't worry, mate. We're going to go over. We're going to go over because I want to hear what you're going to say. Laurie, I know you. I, I love talking to you because you're always so passionate about it. And we're all passionate about what we do. But very interesting figures you just said there. 1.5 million visitors with nearly a turnover of a million pound. And you need that money. You need that. Yeah, income. big time. If you just hope that common sense prevails, if you just hope common sense but planning, <laughs> who knows? And Dorian knows more than probably all of us put together. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it, Dorian? Uh, the commercial property sector. So um, are things on the up? Is it looking a bit better? I mean, people seem to be... I, if you, I've been out delivering all this week, hence why I'm dressed like this, and there seems to be a lot more people back in their offices. You still there? Yeah, it's an interesting debate, isn't it? And we're spending a lot of time talking about that at the moment with various people. I think it's finding its way. I... I think people are having this debate. No, Dorian, just slow down there, I'm afraid. Senior leaders want staff back in the office. Um, Dorian, I think there, there are benefits to having people back in the office in terms of productivity, but all the We're back. <laughs> We're back now. Yeah, try, 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 that try that. Yeah, try that. Try Carry that. On. Yeah, so there is there is a debate. Um, I, I think that people are just trying to work out what hybrid working actually means. Uh, and I, I think lots of companies I know are having the, the conversation. And I think we'll see a strong return to the office in the autumn. I, I, it's it's um, the, the problem we're going to have as that happens, of course, is car parking, because most of the people we're talking to, they want staff back in the office, but they want to make it as comfortable as possible and people don't want to use public transport they do want car they have their own cars and that's going to cause a problem with car parking the cost of car parking so that there's it's not straightforward there are some some again some infrastructure problems to think about but i think yeah the office will go back um to a greater or lesser degree in the autumn retail sector is really interesting you've still got this split market prime pitch is struggling mm. um you know, I was doing a count, such as my my social life, doing a count of empty shops around the towns of uh, of the county, and it's, it's quite interesting. We're we're slightly below um, or at national average, so it's not doom and gloom, and we're seeing new brands come in, which is interesting. Um, but but we haven't seen that resurgence in prime pitch. It's going to take a while to come through. But if you look at what's happening in Cheltenham there's some signs of coming back and, and look at Cheltenham. they've made the application for creating a shop within a shop similar to the sort of souk model so some interesting things happening some really interesting things happening secondary retail is doing really well industry sector industrial sectors really strong the problem we've got there is is um stock but what we're seeing really interesting right locally just within the last three four months is we're, we're increasingly working with local businesses to look at ways to release capital, working capital from their fixed assets, because the cost of borrowing and, and access to debt finance is becoming harder and harder. Um, so we're seeing more sale and lease backs and advising how we can release um, capital that's locked into fixed assets. It's funny that you mentioned that about the commercial property sector and uh, the industry itself. Again, you know, what I've seen around the place is that industry is really strong, really strong, especially anything to do with the avionics industry is just mm. motoring along and they're doing extremely well. You are right. It's the hospitality, the retail sector, especially in some of the smaller towns. You know, one of my guys were, were out delivering Cinderford. I don't want to ever down a town, but they were saying it's really, really uh, struggled recently yeah I've never been out there and yet we go over to nails with tetbury cyber sister seems to be doing really really well tewkesbury's got some new shops in although i'm a bit worried about the some of the brands that are moving into tewkesbury high street actually you know you're talking really? about some of the sort of fast food chains and uh you know what effect what effect the new dobbies is going to have and and all that that's going to be built along there as well so who yeah, knows? there's interest, interesting research. There's this Richter scale of health, which basically looks at users in high streets and clustering effects of fast food on, on public health. Uh, and, and you look at Tewkesbury, yeah, I've got similar concerns about it. Um, yeah. There are um, some worries. Do Dobbies, I think as a sort of, as a gimmick, I think we'll do okay. I'm not sure it's a long-term play. Um, you mean Dobbies but, on the, the mini Dobbies? You, you yeah, 
yeah, they're also having a mini B and Q as well. There's mini B and Q mm. being done. There's they seem to be moving into the high streets like that. Is it because rents are so low at the moment? Rents are well comparatively low, and I think it's still trying to find its feet. But but what we are seeing is that move to back towards physical stores. Online retailing has sort of plateaued, and you look at the results from um, the pure online retailers, and they're still in profit, but not as strong as they were. And it's that that multi um, facet retailing that's really coming back to the fore and i think that's because of this the, the credit crunch the people are worried about the cost of delivery and return and they're actually click and collecting they're collecting in stores which is forcing retailers back to high streets yeah so I, it's I, good news hopefully I, I, the one worry as i've been going around every everybody said it's really quiet this week really quiet week and, and maybe it's the end of the month maybe because there's not some money maybe coronation they spent a lot of money um, but especially in the hospitality, the food side, and, and even some sort of smaller furniture places were saying it's very, very quiet at the moment. Uh, maybe the cost of living, as in mortgages, is going to have a big impact now as they've gone up. Anyway, let's not get too doomy and gloomy. Let's finish off with the stories from Punchline that caught your time because we're slightly over. But Andy, what's caught your eye this week's Punch Place? Yeah, so, so um, what caught my eye was an article on the Three Counties show um, and the future of farming zone in the Three Counties show. So, so, so the first thing is, as I've said, you know, I'm new to the area, so I'm very much looking forward to, to going to the Three Counties show for, for the first time this year. So that's that's great. Um, I, I guess the other thing is, and it, this links back to um, Hartbury, um, only yesterday we launched our uh, Hartbury Digital Studio and Digital Skills Framework um, in, in the agricultural area. So we had um, a, a fantastic event where we were showcasing um, a, a range of things, and, and I think one of the one of the things that was uh, really good was that we have a digital studio where we're able now to give students experience of large scale equipment. So, for example, driving combine harvest, harvesters, um, driving tractors, those sorts of things in a very safe environment in a, in the digital world. So it gives them. An opportunity to experience some of those really um, expensive, really complicated bits of kit, um, but doing it very safely. So it was just fantastic to see technology feeding into that in such a strong way. There's a um, th th there's a lot of virtual reality. There's a lot of augmented reality, um, and it's just great to see that coming through into agriculture. The skills framework's all about. Um, trying to um, just make farmers aware of what's available to, to try and help them, to try and develop their businesses. And I just thought it was a really interesting thing in the three counties show that there is this future of farming zone for exchanging ideas. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea and it keys in very, very nicely to some of the things that we offer here at uh, Harbridge. No, no, I'd love to be invited along to drive a combine harvester, actually. It's always been one of my ambitions. Uh, <laughs> They're wonderful. I had, I had a go yesterday, and I, and I have to say, it, it didn't go terribly well. <laughs> <laughs> got to, got to, I, I'll need that invite soon, Andy, please. Okay, thanks. So it's Laurie, what have, what have you chosen for this week's punchline? Okay, I'll try and keep it quite quickly, everybody. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you don't have to tell me that. I'll, I'll keep it tight. Um, I think for me, um, the story that that hit me a bit was um about the changes to BBC, and to local radio, and that Mark Cummins has now decided to move on. And the reason I say that, I know he wasn't the only one. I think there was others like Faye Hatchers going as well. But I think um having having had a career as a director of communications prior to becoming a chief executive for me lo local radio has always been the backbone of of that really about getting news out and as as mark you will know my my previous role before i came to cheltenham was i was leading on novichok in salisbury as as the the communications lead and for me it, it was local radio that was the absolute backbone of getting those messages out and working with the local community and and giving that reassurance to Salisbury about what was really happening on the ground. And I just think it's very um, short sighted of the BBC to take away that localism. Um, and, and, and they're saying they're going to go more online and more digital. But I just think there's something about community that BBC radio does so well. And if they don't do it, I think others will come in and take that over. So maybe, Mark, you need to move into radio. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Right, Dorian. <laughs> Dorian, what have you picked out from this week's punch, please? Uh, very quickly, immigration. You mentioned earlier the fact that um, uh, immigration is painted as this great evil uh, and it's a terrible, terrible thing. But as you said, every sector we talk to is struggling for labour. 
that manpower is really short and uh, there needs to be a, a debate between business and government and try and get this thing sorted out um, for the greater good because we get more people in productivity increases economy gets back on track Totally agree. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, my top story was actually the uh, the launch of the new showroom at Moog or the the Moog new factory, forty million pound investment. I managed to talk to the manager, the, sorry, the president of Moog actually. Uh, fantastic uh, guy, and uh, what a fantastic facility uh, it is there in Tewkesbury as well. So much good stuff in Tewkesbury at the moment. Brilliant. Anyway, I'd like to thank my fantastic guests. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. If you like the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And also a big thank you to Hazelwoods, accountants and business advisors, who we couldn't do the show without, who kindly sponsor us. So thank you to them as well. If you like the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And this is the last one for a couple of weeks. I'm actually going to have a bit of a break. Anyway, until that time, see you in very soon. Thanks for watching. Bye. And Dory's turned up to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>